Join us in the chat every Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern for live music reactions right here on this YouTube channel. Historically, when members leave a band on good or bad terms, it can be tough to navigate the path forward. But when a group of people experience tragedy together as a unit, things can quickly fall apart at the seams, as these situations often involve something extremely bleak. A few years back on SOS, I showed you a batch of bands that fell apart after fame, and while those stories had an underlying darkness, today's are much darker. I don't want to waste too much time with introductions, since these stories all deserve to be told individually, so hit that like button to support the show, join the conversation in the comments, and let's get to it. And I love me come a funeral pie. The Doors were easily one of the most influential rock bands of the 1960s, with their fusion of blues rock and psychedelia, but their red-hot momentum was cut down in its tracks by the untimely departure and eventual death of their leader, Jim Morrison. Cold classic no longer suited The Doors by the end of that decade. They were chart-topping superstars. But after the release of their fifth album in 1970, tensions grew within the band due to Morrison's increasingly erratic behavior at the hands of his addiction. The following year, before the release of the beloved album L.A. Woman, the troubled musician moved from the States to Paris to take a break from the music scene and focus on his writing, a break that he sadly never returned home from. On July 3rd, 1971, Morrison was found dead in his bathtub at the age of 27, reportedly of heart failure, although pretty much any fan with a pulse would dispute the cause of death since no autopsy was ever performed. Here's a question, what do you do when you've got this highly successful household name band, but your frontman suddenly joins the 27 Club right as the 27 Club is even becoming an urban legend? Well, if you're the remaining members of The Doors, you attempt to continue on without Jim Morrison, but you don't get very far, seeing how their final two albums, Other Voices and Full Circle, were insulting attempts at recreating the once effortless magic. The Doors officially pulled the plug on what had become a sick and miserable patient in 1973 realizing along with the rest of the world that there was no way they could continue on without their visionary frontman at the wheel. Music should be something we hear, but also feel, because what you use to listen matters, and that's why this video is sponsored by Status Audio. I've officially been using Status earbuds for over a year now, and I can confidently say I'm never going back. They just dropped the Between 3 A and C true wireless Bluetooth buds that feature their most crystal clear sound ever, thanks to the built-in triple driver system that allows for dedicated processing of the mid, space, and treble. It's seriously impressive how much power they packed in. They also now support wireless charging alongside the active noise canceling and transparency modes that are always just a tap away. For those of you that like to shake up your sound, the three ANCs now have a dedicated app where you can tune your EQ settings and save presets that bring out the best quality no matter what genre you're spinning. It's audio file quality in your pocket at an affordable price. Try them out and if for some reason you're not satisfied, you've got 30 days to return, so grab a pair at the top link in the description, and make sure to plug in code ARTV at checkout to unlock an extra 10% off your order. The story of the exploding hearts is one of the saddest ones out there because it felt like everyone was rooting for the young band's breakthrough and right as their moment finally came, an unimaginable disaster stole it away. The hearts hailed from Portland, Oregon and made waves for daring to stand out from the melancholic music scene that the Northwest states had become known for by the early aughts. With the release of their debut album Guitar Romantic in March 2003, music publications began routinely name dropping them as a band to watch, so naturally, more fans started showing up to their high-octane concerts. After a run of electrifying shows in the summer of 03, fate dealt the exploding hearts an unbelievably cruel hand. The band had just played a venue in San Francisco and were driving their van back to Portland when bass player Matt Fitzgerald fell asleep at the wheel. The vehicle ran off the road at a high speed and crashed, killing all but one of the four members instantly. Band manager Rachel Ramos and guitarist Terry Six somehow made it out alive, 
but they couldn't say the same for their fallen brothers. In the wake of this tragedy, the power pop meets punk rock daydream of the exploding hearts came crashing down. One day there was nowhere to go but up, and the next, a heavy gloom had taken everything, as their sole surviving member was left with no choice but to close the book on what looked to be an extremely promising chapter. I was unknowingly familiar with Badfinger before this video, but after sitting with some of their albums and learning the story of this Welsh band, I'm devastated on their behalf because these Beatles protégés were really good. Badfinger formed in the 60s as the Ivies and caught a huge break by attracting the Beatles' Apple Records for a recording contract that gave the band a relatively peaceful half-decade of success. It was unfortunately during this time that a businessman named Stan Polly weaseled his way into their camp as band manager. This wolf in sheep's clothing destroyed everything the lads had built by draining their finances, not paying out royalties, and leaving them destitute by the mid-70s. Polly negotiated a new record deal with Warner Brothers after a falling out with Apple. However, this new deal meant that they had to pump out two albums a year while their deceitful managers sat back and collected a fraudulently high amount of money off the top. In April 1975, lead singer and guitarist Pete Ham died by suicide, directly blaming his financial ruin on their invisible manager who was nowhere to be found when Ham continuously reached out about getting paid. His death marked the end of Badfinger for the moment, but with money being tight and the solo careers they embarked on not turning a profit, the remaining members reunited for a bizarre on and off again iteration that brought about no new classics and ended again with the tragic suicide of bass player Tom Evans in 1983. London, England had such an insane amount of talent flooding out in the 60s and 70s that it's understandable how some of the success stories might slip your mind. Thank God this next one is a literal 12-foot-tall dinosaur. The early days of T-Rex consisted of a hazy, psychedelic folk sound that eventually led to the dawning of glammed-up rock and roll, with their only permanent member Mark Bolin, often cited as the founding father of glam rock, after his flamboyant 1971 performance on Top of the Pops. After abbreviating the band name from Tyrannosaurus Rex in 1970, Bolin's success fully ignited with multiple hit albums dropping in the early part of that decade, as glam rock became a much more popular genre. During these exhausting years on the road, Mark Bolin sort of stopped taking care of himself and started experimenting with funk, disco, and R&B in the house of T-Rex. The album sales in the mid-70s were very slow causing the act to begin fading into irrelevance until Bolin made some lifestyle changes, got healthier mentally, and brought back a revamped version of the sound that put them on the map. Life seemed to be going well as Bolin unearthed T-Rex's deliciously fun Dandy in the Underworld in the spring of 77 to highly positive reviews, but on September 15th of that same year, Bolin and his girlfriend Gloria Jones went for a night out on the town, not knowing that everything was about to change. After a late night of dining and drinking, Jones began driving the couple home in Bolin's purple Mini 1275 GT. She lost control of the car while going over a bridge in South London, smashing head-on into a tree which severely injured Jones and killed Bolin upon impact. This horrific, unexpected death sent shockwaves throughout the UK and beyond, as Bolin had only just begun his return to fame. T-Rex's management were forced to disband the project immediately as Mark was their only constant member, leaving multiple creative projects from music to film permanently frozen in time. This next story breaks my heart because it involves kids, so if you're not all that familiar with the story of the Welsh rock band Lost Profits, I'm gonna give you a glimpse of a terrifying real-life monster. New metal reached its fever pitch as a genre around the turn of the 21st century, with Lost Prophets contributing to the movement in a very big way with two successful albums, The Fake Sound of Progress and Start Something, before shifting gears into mainstream rock. The release of their third album, Liberation Transmission, submitted their international appeal and hit number one in the UK, launching multiple hit singles, including Rooftops, which was huge in the States. Lost Prophets continued their successful run with two more top 10 albums in 2010 and 2012, with the latter seeing daylight just before the news of their singer's crimes came barreling to the surface. Ian Watkins is a name you're likely all too familiar with. 
He's the former leader of this band, but his legacy now will always be that of a convicted, disgraceful pedophile. Watkins developed a reputation for being rather unhinged after years of slowly falling apart at the seams. Bizarre live performances were spread online in the early 2010s, alongside leaked videos that showed the singer in compromising situations, and with a dose of alleged inappropriate behavior with fans on top, the singer was finally arrested on drug charges, with a court demanding that his home be searched. What investigators found on his home computer is the stuff of nightmares. They found loads of explicit images of kids, extreme bestiality porn, and highly sexualized chat logs. News that confused the general public when it broke, including his own bandmates, who immediately went into a state of shock. After a lengthy trial the next year, Watkins was found guilty of numerous assaults against children, including literal infants, later showcasing just how big of a piece of shit he is, with a recorded call from prison being leaked where he talked to a female fan about his sentencing being mega lulls. What Watkins did to those innocent kids and all of his victims, all while playing good guy rock star to save face in the public, is the definition of fucked up. But there's still the element of sympathy that I have for the remaining bandmates who were left questioning everything they thought they knew. Those members released a statement at the end of 2013 saying, After nearly a year of coming to terms with our heartache, we will no longer make or perform music as lost profits. A full decade later, they've stayed true to their word, instead launching a new band called No Devotion, which was born from the ashes of lost profits with Thursday's Jeff Rickley serving as their new frontman. And they're actually really good. A viewer submitted them recently at a live stream, and I've enjoyed all of the material I've heard, so check them out and remember, Always be wary of false prophets. I feel so alone, gonna end up a big old pile of them bones. Alice in Chains were one of grunge's big four, alongside the legendary Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, and Nirvana. Their entire outlook as a unit was the direct antithesis to the over-the-top mantra of 80s cock rock, subverting expectations by letting the music speak loudly over the course of three masterful albums, a chilling EP, and the unforgettable MTV Unplugged in 1996. For many, Lane Staley may have been the face of the band, but he was in no way the only thing that made AIC special. Jerry Cantrell's blackened vocals added depth as his sludge factory guitars ripped like a stinging flesh wound, pairing with Lane to make a tortured weapon that previewed what was really brewing beneath the surface. Lane battled addiction throughout his years with Alice thanks to his own deadbeat dad reintroducing drugs to him at age 20. What had initially worked well came to a breaking point shortly after their MTV Unplugged. It was obvious to their fans that something was wrong after the band failed to tour in support of their 1995 self-titled album, and when the struggling vocalist walked off of the stage following a show supporting Kiss in July 1996, he never returned. Time passed without many updates as he slipped further into reclusion, and when Lane gave his final interview a few years later, he stated that he knew he was dying as his dependence on heroin and crack cocaine was equated to that of a diabetic needing insulin just to survive. Lane Thomas Staley was found dead in his apartment by Seattle PD on April 19th, 2002. Medical experts traced his actual date of death to April 5th, meaning that for two weeks, the grunge icon sat upright in his chair, dead, with a syringe in hand. Their former bass player Mike Starr also died of an overdose years later in 2011, claiming he had been present the night before Lane shot the killer speedball, which went on to make him blame himself for the singer's death. The rest of the guys took their rightfully earned time away to rebuild and simply process the loss, eventually returning with a new vocalist William Duvall in 2009, who continues on with the reborn version of Alice in Chains to this day. Led Zeppelin were the most popular band of the 1970s, surpassing the sales of industry titans like Fleetwood Mac, the Rolling Stones, and everyone else in their way. They gained a cult-like following initially as fans gravitated to their tender but often complex recordings, but the underground couldn't hold the Zep for long as humble beginnings later became crowds of more than 100,000 people. Robert Plant was the obvious superstar with his one in a million vocal, but something about Zeppelin's rise to fame felt different. As each member 
from their shredder Jimmy Page, bassist John Paul Jones, and drummer John Bonham all received praise and attention for what they brought to the band. While there definitely were hardships in their relatively short 12-year tenure, nothing seemed to be capable of slowing them down, even if critics were pretty divided on their later year's albums, including what ended up being their final In Through the Outdoor. Tragedy had already greeted their frontman several times, with a terrible car crash in 1975 and the death of his son in 1977, but the straw that broke the band's back was the untimely passing of their very own John Bonham. The drummer's drinking had gotten out of control, with some theorizing that his collapse on stage in the summer of 1980 was a direct result of this. Later that year, during rehearsals for their first North American tour since 77, Bonham started drinking copious amounts of vodka that he sometimes referred to as his breakfast, before dying in his sleep due to asphyxiation on the night of September 25th after excess drinking. It's incredibly sad to see such a talented soul dead at the young age of 32, but his bandmates honored his legacy by retiring Led Zeppelin permanently in a statement that read, We wish it to be known that the loss of our dear friend and the deep sense of undivided harmony felt by ourselves and our manager have led us to decide that we could not continue as we were, thus marking the tragic end of one of the best bands to ever do it. That's a wrap on this week's 7 on Sunday. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe on your way out, and take to the comments with your thoughts on any of these stories I covered. Check out Bands That Fell Apart After Fame on screen, and I'll see you next week with more.